Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Sunday Morning Bible Study for July 8, 2012. Today in our Gospel of Matthew Bible Study, we focus on Matthew chapter 27, verse 62, through chapter 28, verse 15. Let's listen in. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for your Son, Jesus. We thank you that he has uh, died for our sins uh, and risen for our justification, that he has left death behind uh, and will take us into eternal life with you one day. We pray today, Lord, that as we study the resurrection, we would rejoice in the great things we read here, uh, and that your hand would be upon us, guiding us. Send us your Holy Spirit, Lord, to understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. The thing I'm looking forward to most right now is that Justin and Sammy are here, because this means that uh, Doug and Sylvia will be peppered with all kinds of questions. <laughs> Stuff. Okay, um, we, where do we end? We ended with the death of Jesus, yes? And that's the last thing we discussed, I believe. I want to do an awful lot today. Um, so I, I, we'll see how far we can go. Uh, Matthew 28 is a pretty short chapter, but there's a great amount in there that we need to discuss. Uh, so I'll see how far we get. But I'd like to, like to try and finish today. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that next week you just have a week off, but uh, we'll see. <coughs> All right. Um, so Jesus is is uh, dies on the cross. Uh, the last words of Christ from the cross in Matthew's gospel are what? Last things he says before he dies. Hmm? Why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is where it becomes very helpful to have. A uh, red letter Bible because you can just look real quick for the red letters and say, "Oh, that must be it." Ah, uh, it's a cheat. It's a nice cheat. Um, Jesus says, "Why have you forsaken me?" Then he dies. The temple is the curtain is torn in two. Why is that significant? Go, Justin, who wasn't even here. Why is that significant, Justin? Because nobody besides the priests had been able to go there. Correct. And now. What does it mean that the temple's curtain is torn? That he truly was the Son of God. That's, that's correct. Yes. Yes. And also, that who was behind the curtain? Why could no one else go back there? Who was behind the curtain? You know? The ark. The ark. And who, who was on the ark? Who were they sacrificing to back there on the ark? You know? God. Yeah. God was behind the curtain. See? You couldn't get to God. Because uh, if you weren't back there, you know what he would do? Have you ever seen Indiana Jones? That's what would happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, you would be zapped and you would die. Uh, and your skull would implode, which is very bizarre stuff. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you couldn't go behind the curtain because that's where the Holy of Holies, remember? And, and that's where God was. And uh, once a year, the priest would go back there to offer up the sacrifice uh, for the forgiveness of sins, for the atonement. Uh, and now, that temple curtain is torn. <coughs> Which meant what? Where's God now? Among us. Among us. Yeah. See, the temple curtain was torn, remember, not bottom up, top to bottom. God was the one tearing the temple curtain, and he was, uh, it wasn't so much now that people could access God, it was rather that God was coming out of the temple um, at us <laughs> in mercy and in grace because the ultimate atonement had been made. Christ had sacrificed himself on the cross, okay? Um, then a centurion sees this happen, an earthquake takes place, and the only one who seems to get it right in the whole chapter is this centurion who says, truly this was the Son of God, right? Truly this was the Son of God. Everyone else who had been calling him the Son of God had been doing so ironically. They'd been mocking him. Uh, his own disciples had left him. God had forsaken him. The only one who... Uh, shows up and, and says something hopeful seems to be this guy. Truly this was the Son of God. Then some women see this all happen. Mary Magdalene, another Mary, uh, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee, who's most likely named Mary, just because what else did they name women in those days? Apparently <laughs> nothing but Mary. Uh, and if they run out of Marys, then they also go with Martha, because they're very creative. So, um, <laughs> a lot of options. Mm -hmm. So uh, they take the body down. This rich man named Joseph of Arimathea, who has a tomb which no one's body has ever been laid in, uh, puts Jesus in the tomb, and this is a sign of royalty, incidentally. 
uh, or wealth. Um, very rich and powerful people had their own tombs. Uh, they buried people in there, and it was only for family. This guy gave his tomb to Jesus. Very interesting. He's wrapped in the Shroud of Turin, which you can all see on display on the Discovery Channel. Uh, now, and they laid him in a tomb, which was cut in the rock. And they rolled a great stone in the entrance of the tomb. And when they, and I'll describe this in a second. And Mary and Mac, and Mary and Mary and Mary and Mary uh, were there sitting opposite the tomb. In other words, the Marys knew where the tomb was. Now, this is very important for us today. The Marys knew. Those who go to uh, embalm the body later know exactly where he is. They saw where his body was laid. Matthew and Mark, are very, and I think Luke too, are very specific in, in pointing this out. It's a very important thing, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, the rocks kind of worked like this. You would have a tomb. Here we are. Uh, and it wasn't like they just said, hey, we should put a boulder in front of that. Uh, they actually had stones that kind of were, were circles like this. And in front of the entrance to the tomb, there was a little groove cut out. So you could just roll the stone in front of it. And it was actually not impossible uh, to push the stone away. It wasn't an easy thing to do. It was a heavy stone. Uh, but that was done on purpose, because I mean, if you're going to be using a tomb for multiple bodies, you've got to be able to get in and out. Uh, and so that's sort of what it would look like. They would roll the stone in front, okay? Um, so just so you are aware, that's kind of how that worked. All right? All right. Can somebody read for us then? Verse 27, chapter, excuse me, chapter 27 in Matthew, verses 62 through 66. I'll read that. Uh, the guard at the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remembered that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, again, or me, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Okay. Um... And actually, I don't know if this is interesting. My translation says you have a guard of soldiers. That is to say, it wasn't just one guy, uh, but a guard is in a group of soldier guards. Right? So multiple guys are put in front of the tomb. Um, and so now this is very interesting. What, what's wrong with the Pharisees and the chief priests? What do they think is going to happen? I don't think somebody's going to take his body. Yeah, well, why? What, what reason do they give? To pretend he rose from the dead. Yeah, but why would, I mean, what are they, what, why, how do they get to that conclusion? Because they remember what Jesus said. Yeah, here's some people who actually know what Jesus said. And so what Matthew, I think, is sort of doing here, I mean, this is reality, but why Matthew is bringing this up is there's multiple th things going on here. One, it's almost as if the Pharisees were listening a little closer than the disciples. Because where are the disciples? I, yeah, the, the Pharisees are scared of these disciples. Well, guess what? These disciples are scared of these Pharisees. And they're nowhere to be found. It's sort of funny. Um, but the other thing is this. These guys are implicated. Remember earlier, let his blood be on our heads? They have no way to stand before the judgment seat of God and say, we didn't know he would rise. Because they knew it was a, something he had said. They were fully aware of Jesus' teachings. They weren't ignorant of what Jesus said. They just didn't believe. It's faithlessness. It, they can't plead before God. We had no idea. No, they had every idea. They never told anyone? Who? The disciples. That Jesus said that he would write. Uh, not at this point. They, they will, yeah, uh, they will. Because they'll write the New Testament and but they'll have the whole ministry. But at this point, they're hiding in fear. They're nowhere to be found. And we'll see that here in a second. So, the scene is set. I believe this is on Saturday, which is also a little ironic. Because you can't do anything on Saturday if you're a Jew. Uh, but here they are. It's the day after preparation day, which would be Friday. So this is Saturday. I've never heard of preparation day. Preparation for the Sabbath. Oh, the yeah. Jewish tradition. Yeah, so all the stuff you would be doing because you can't do it the next day. So there's Sabbath days on Saturday? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, 
There you have it. Oh, by the way, we should just do this real briefly. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. There's a lot of discussion over the fact that, wait a minute, he, he dies on Friday and he rises on Sunday. That doesn't seem like three days. Well, in a Jewish calendar, that's three days. Uh, the first day is Friday. Uh, he dies before six. Then on Saturday, which is the second day, uh, oh, it's all here in your, in your book here. The Sabbath began at 6 p.m. on Friday, ended at 6 p.m. on Saturday. So there's two days there. And the first day of the week, Sunday, began at 6 p.m. on Saturday. So in other words, on the Jewish calendar, it wasn't like midnight, it's now the next day. It's 6 p.m. sundown, and now it's the next day. So Sunday, for the, in a sense, the Sabbath ended at 6 p.m. Saturday night. Does that make sense? So that would have begun the third day. So when Jesus says three days, that's where he's gone. Okay, great. Um, good. So we have the stage set. You have a dead body in a tomb. You have soldiers in front of the tomb. You have uh, the Romans and the Jews both wanting to keep him in the tomb, both wanting him there. Okay? Stage is set. Where are his disciples to rescue the body and start their big conspiracy? They're off hiding somewhere, nowhere to be found. Who's the only one who's going to pay any respect to Jesus at this point? The, the women. The Marys. Mary. The Marys. <laughs> All right. So, if someone could read for us Matthew 28, 1 through 10. Before you go on, yeah. this kind of something that's a little puzzling about this. The original statement that Jesus made was, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it mm -hmm. in three days. Mm -hmm. The disciples initially thought he was talking about the Jerusalem temple. Yes. And so did the Pharisees. Uh-huh. Now there's a switch here, because now all of a sudden they understand it not as destroying the, the Jerusalem temple, which was blasphemy to them, but they understand it as the resurrection. Right. Which is a, a change from the original charges. Charges they're bringing against them. Yeah. yeah, that is interesting. Now, Jesus had also said... I'm going to Jerusalem to die and rise. I mean, he did say that he would have resurrection. It wasn't all very cryptic and prophetic and all of that. Uh, he did very clearly say, uh, I'm going to die and rise. And so they probably heard that as well. But that sort of thing wasn't brought up in the charges. And you're absolutely right. The charges were, destroy, I'm going to destroy the temple and rebuild it. It was against the Jerusalem temple. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. So yeah. very interesting. When he said that I'm going to die and rise again, he was speaking to the disciples, wasn't he? Yes, however... <sighs> It's, now, this is something worth looking at, because in Matthew's, I'm not sure how many people were around, and even if it was just the disciples. Hi, Nancy. Nancy, people were here early, so we started without you. I'm sorry. That's why I'm running late. So oh, man, matter. see. Uh, double win. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's quite right. Look, we'd have to look at that. Go back, then. We'll start at Matthew 16. It's it's likely he said the same thing on many occasions. Yeah, the one that's recorded. but there is but there is. And this is actually something worth noting, but I can't. We we may not want to spend a whole lot of time on it here. Uh, in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel, uh, you'll find Jesus going into the house sometimes. And when he goes into the house, this is teaching just for the disciples. Uh, and then sometimes he'll be teaching out, you know, on a mountain or in public, and that's teaching sort of for everybody. And that's that's. Very clear. And so it's a curious question, if you're a Matthew person, uh, where was he when he was making these pronouncements? Was it just with the twelve? Was it with all the disciples? Was it just, was it a, a big public pronouncement? Um, it is likely, though, that they were aware of this, that on some level it was either public or made public. So they, they knew of it somewhere along the way. Okay. And they got guards. So to make sure that the disciples don't try and cook up some scheme. Now, why would the disciples cook up a scheme to steal the body? What would be the end of that? The goal, I should say. What would be the goal of that? To tell everyone he had risen. Why? Why would they want to do that? Probably to save their skin. Okay. But it would prove that, that he was the Messiah. Isn't it their lack of faith? They didn't believe. Yeah, they didn't believe he was going to do it. They didn't believe. Yeah. Okay, I, so if he's still dead, and they start saying, well, he rose again. You think that's going to make them look good? They think that's going to make them look good. 
That's what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. I would say so. Yeah. Okay. That everything he, Jesus had said came true. Right. But why would that... Okay, so here's my question. Why would that matter if everybody knew he had died on the cross and nobody could see his risen body? See, he, if, if they go around and start saying, oh, he rose again, if he didn't actually rise again, they're just going to look like fools. That's not going to help their cause at all. They're going to say, what are you talking about? We all saw him die. What do you mean he rose again? That's ridiculous. So, so where is he? And in fact, yeah. even, with, even with the resurrection, <coughs> Jesus appearing to many people, afterwards when the disciples are preaching the gospel, they suffer terribly for it. Exactly. Now this is where I'm going. Yeah. Do you know why the disciples, I think, if they're going to say we got the resurrected Jesus, I think, why they're going to do that? It's going to make them famous. Uh, look at this. Our Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered death. Now, follow us. We're going to be great leaders. Follow us in this. Now, if that was their plan, cooking up a scheme about the resurrection would be a really dumb thing because it got them killed. <laughs> right? I mean, this is sort of, you hear this, this argument that, well, maybe the disciples made the story up because they thought, well, maybe this will... Uh, this will help us become famous and rich, and then our ideas will promulgate through the eras and all of this. It's like, no, no, probably not. Because if that were the case, don't you think at least one of them, when they're being tied up to a cross, or have uh, a horse on one end of them and a horse on another with ropes but to run after some carrots, don't you think one of them would have said, okay, time out, it was a joke. We just wanted to make some money. Apparently it backfired. Don't you think that would have happened? Yeah. Let's see. So, uh, so the, the Pharisees are probably worried about that kind of scheming going on. Because that's the way they think. Exactly right. <laughs> and so don't let them even get the scheme going. Just make sure that guy stays in the grave. It's Plus, if it happens that Jesus is out of the grave, it makes the Pharisees look really bad because they were wrong. Mm -hmm. If Jesus also comes out of the grave, I don't know, it makes... Um, Oh, yes. Do you have a key to the Sunday school room? Do you have a key? Yeah. yeah. Do you have a key? That's okay. Further, the Romans want him dead because if the Romans don't pull off a, a, a crucifixion, that doesn't look good for them either. They're sort of proud of the way they kill people. They're very good at it. And they don't <laughs> want anyone questioning that. Okay. Uh, and so uh, it's very important to all these people that Jesus stay dead. Okay, now... Matthew 28, 1 through 10. Okay. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> the resurrection. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you, that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, and afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to, to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Okay, so... <coughs> so very interesting. Uh, so, the women, the Marys, uh, went to the tomb. To embalm the body, we know from the other Gospels. I mean, here it's just sort of, says so they're on their way there, and suddenly there's an earthquake. Well, as they're on their way there, they begin to discuss among themselves who's going to roll the stone away. They weren't all that strong. Stones were kind of big. They weren't, they were just, who's going to roll it away? But there's a great earthquake. Now, where was the last earthquake? We just read about an earthquake. When was the last one? Yeah, the crucifixion. Well, this is all very interesting. So, what we, what we want to take from this is God's working. God's working. When you see earthquakes in the Old Testament, it's oftentimes a picture of God's wrath. Um, the prophets, uh, in the book of Amos, for example, Amos is written two years, it says, or I think it's two years, before the great earthquake. And Amos prophesies an earthquake, and he, he prophesies 
uh, a shaking, a shifting, and a, a sifting, and a shaking that's going to happen, and then later on it does happen. And at the beginning of Amos, they say he gave his prophecies before the earthquake, uh, and it wasn't just uh, a rhetorical device. He was really right. There was a great big earthquake, um, and that comes up very often in the Old Testament. Well, earthquakes were seen as uh, instances of God's wrath. Southern California. So, um, <laughs> uh, just some some food for thought. Hold on. And so, uh, uh, we have two earthquakes take place here. And so, if nothing else, the first one obviously is associated with the wrath of God because there's the wrath of God being poured out on Christ. But then, something is sort of unshook, shook loose. God's working again. And death is done with. Death, in a sense, faces the wrath of God because Jesus comes out of the tomb alive. And death dies. How about that? Pretty remarkable stuff. So, Jesus is not in the tomb anymore, but they don't know this yet. Instead, they come to the tomb and they look inside, and what do they see? Wait, what ha wait first, what happened to the soldiers? They played possum. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Have you seen that commercial, the Geico commercial, where the guy says, he says... <laughs> This is a great sidetrack, though. I'm almost not finished today. He goes, the kids really wanted a dog. We couldn't afford a dog. Oh. So I got him a possum. <laughs> and the kids are out there staring at it. He goes, does it do anything? He goes, don't worry. Just play a possum. <laughs> the possum jumps up and hisses at him. <laughs> he goes, see? And the kids all freak out. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that happened in my own backyard. So, um, so Anyhow, those are disgusting little ones. Um, so yeah, the, the soldiers play possum. They become like dead men. Terrified of this. Um, and how, what, what's the attitude of the women as they approach the tomb? They, they go in, and what do they see? An angel. A man in white, bright light. Quite white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled. But the angel said to the woman, what? Women, what? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Suddenly this becomes a, a, a chorus throughout this section. A, a, a back and forth of fear and do not be afraid. Everything from heaven is saying, do not be afraid. Everything from earth is terrified. Um, kind of interesting. Well, from what I'm reading here, it, it says that the angel appeared right where they rolled the tomb, the, in the rock back. Oh, yes. Okay, and, and that um, he explains to him that he's not here. Go and tell the disciples. Right. So the women, it doesn't say that the woman went in there and checked. Okay, yes, yeah. so they, they, uh, the, they see the angel on the outside. On the outside. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. They, they listened and they hurried away, and on the way, that's when Jesus greeted them. That's right, yeah. So I think it's the disciples. I think it's it's Peter and John when they get there. They, they went in and checked them. them. Yeah, that's but the yeah, woman believed the angel. They, well, they, yeah. Because the, 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 the centurion guards were just like pooping their pants. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's, I think, <laughs> our, or playing possum or yeah. filling their diapers or whatever it is that they were doing, yeah. Uh, which, which, incidentally, we would all do if we saw an angel. Oh. Remember this about angels. Uh, this is a very important rule about angels. They're not fat, chubby little babies. <laughs> Your little precious moments things? <laughs> Ick. That's not an angel. We're on our way to heaven? Yeah, right. No, it's not, yeah, it's not a Michael... Uh, uh, Landon. Michael Landon, yeah, no. Uh, none of them are that good looking, I'm sure. Or they're much better looking than Michael Landon, sure. if you could even imagine. Um, <laughs> Even though the angel did invite the women to look inside, tell them see the place. Yeah, he look, yeah, he points out the tomb. They they look in the tomb to see the body's not there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay. And so, uh, whatever happens, an angel says there's no body here, and there's no body, there. not there. And so uh, they departed, and and. And how did they depart? Quick, filled with joy. And what else? They hurried away. Afraid. Afraid and with joy. <clears throat> you ever been there? Odd, yeah. odd sort of feeling. Burned to my son. Yeah, exactly. That's a great analogy. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what am I going to 
don't know. <laughs> no, I think it depends on me. Really um, <laughs> yeah, maybe take that and turn it up a couple of notches. Yeah, that, so this is where the women are. In, Ma in Mark's gospel, they just leave terrified, and then the gospel ends. <laughs> How about that? Here, Matthew's not so uh, short. Uh, they're, they're terrified but excited because there's no body and who would have taken it? So, uh, plus an angel talked to him. So this is an overwhelming experience. I, I tend to think that if we want to wonder how we'll feel on Judgment Day, <coughs> this is it. For those of us who are, are baptized into the faith. Terrified and full of joy. Because it will be like nothing we've ever seen. Completely overwhelming. Luther says even on that day, uh, Christians will... Uh, be clinging to the cross for fear of what they're seeing in the glory of Christ. You think about it, that's a little scary. The other, the other analogy is, uh, that's a great one, is um, sort of the language of Aslan, if you've ever read the line, The Witch of the Wardrobe, uh, and you see the lion, the great lion Aslan, the kids see the lion coming and they say, well, is he good? Or is, is he a... Uh, a tame lion. Is he a tame lion? There it is. And they say, no, no, no. He's not a tame lion, but he's good, you know, and that's, that's sort of how it is here with the resurrected Jesus. He's not a tame God, but he's good, and that should scare us a little bit and fill us with joy. It's good heavens. Here's a Jesus you can't control. Death can't even control him. What do you think you're going to do to him? You know, <laughs> he's in charge, not you. Wow, look out. And so the women run back, and uh, they meet Jesus uh, Jesus meets them along the way and says greetings, and uh, they are overwhelmed, and they fall and take hold of his feet and worship him. Now, it's very significant that they take hold of his feet. Do you know why? He tells the others not to touch him. You know, that's in a different gospel. So I, I was going to deal with that, but I'm like, I, it's a whole other thing. So no, but this is something, It's in I think it's in John's gospel. He said, Mary grabs him and says, I have not yet ascended to my father. Don't take hold of me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the idea there is, um, you're not, you still don't get it, but, but that's a lot. That one has to be solid substance for them to yes. grab onto him. And that's the key. And what's more, in the ancient world, if you read the literature, I guess, I haven't. Someone told me this in a book I read. Uh, if you read the ancient, the literature in the ancient world, when ghosts or spirits are described, you know what? They don't have feet. They're feetless beings. So Matthew points out that when they grab them, they don't just grab a body, they grab the feet of the body to point out this is no spirit, this is him. This is the guy actually walking out of the tomb with real live feet. It's not just floating around, you know. Where are you reading this? Uh, verse 9. They took hold of his feet because he is not a ghost, and they worshipped him. And Jesus' first words to them? Do not be afraid. Pure gospel. Pure good news. Do not be afraid. When you read this in John's gospel, uh, every time Jesus shows up, he's saying, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. You were going to say something else? No. Okay. Um, do not be afraid. Or peace be with you. That's what it is in Matt and John's gospel. Peace be with you. Sort of the same idea. And go tell my brothers in Galilee, and then they will see me. Now, Jesus had told them already that they would see him in Galilee, and now he's fulfilling his promise. Tell them to go to Galilee to see me. He's told them before that that's where they will see him. Why Galilee? Uh, that's where they were from, I think. Uh, you know where they were hiding? No, they were probably hiding somewhere in Jerusalem. They probably weren't too far from Jerusalem at this point. Um, because that's where all this stuff went down. Galilee is a pretty big district. They must have had a better idea than that. Yeah, I mean, I imagine when he says Galilee, there's an idea. they know where to go. Remember, Judas knows where Jesus is praying in the garden. I mean, they probably understand what he they're means. Probably, they're probably thinking Capernaum or something. Yeah, yeah, that would be my guess. But that's, I mean, that's where the majority of Jesus' ministry took place, right? And so that's where they're from. So go to Galilee, that's where they'll see him. Okay, so... Now we have this. The resurrected Jesus has appeared to the women. The tomb is empty. The soldiers are pooped out. <laughs> Everything is undone. So what are the Pharisees to do? 
So I'm going to read verses 11 through 15. Sure. Thank you. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So, uh, when they say, uh, we will keep you out of trouble, it means you won't get your heads chopped off, you know, for not doing your job. On the job, yeah. And there's a guard was an executable. Yeah, that's so... Um, I think that's unusual about that. Hmm. These Some of the guards are allies of Jesus. Though? No, no, no one's ever. No, 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 no. Some of the, it's, it says that some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests. <laughs> they reported to the chief priests and not their uh, Roman uh, officers. Who brought did not get their heads chopped off? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that is curious, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, who was paying them? I mean, it was the Jews who had. Passed at that point, they weren't. <laughs> They were just soldiers you know, on duty. Right, yeah. So they, they weren't, they hadn't been paid yet. Yeah, that is interesting. It was but, Pilate who put them there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Interesting. But you, you might have a point there saying, oh, yeah, this guy got away, we're going to get killed. Well, let's see if we can go yeah. talk to the priests first. They're probably not dumb it. soldiers. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> no one's very dumb when your neck is on the line. Yeah, right? so, so let's, yeah. yeah. all that, let's see. Priest is well sitting up to. Yeah, they can't report. Oh, sorry. Oops. Sorry, boss. Got well, yeah. and they got a lot of money. But also, they had to trust the chief priest that if they got into trouble, the priests were going to protect them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But what is so interesting here, uh, by the way, given what we were talking about before, the chief priests and the, the elders, they knew of the promises of the resurrection. Now, here come the soldiers. Confirming. confirming it. And what's their response? Covered up. Unbelief. Yeah. yeah, covered up. Good heavens, what's gone on? Well, let's cover this one up too. And I mean, it's just, it's very bizarre. Is it really unbelief or is it we've got to cover our books? I don't know if you would make a difference there. They don't, they certainly, it's a lack of faith. I mean, they're not trusting the promises. I mean, when I say unbelief, I don't mean they doubt the resurrection. Okay. I think I'm saying unbelief in terms of um, they don't fall down and repent no. for what they've done. Yeah. That, that's where they, I'm going. Yeah, yeah. They realize they were wrong. Yes, perhaps. Covered. Perhaps, yes. Um, they were too proud to admit. Yeah, and I think that's right. I think it's absolutely right. Um, that's how the parables of Jesus often describe them, full of pride. Um, and even Pilate, remember when Pilate is... is uh, putting Jesus on trial, he sees the pride of them and, and tries to take advantage. Yes, yeah, so there's another thing here too. These are the chief priests, and for the most part, they were members of the Sadducees <laughs> who didn't believe in the resurrection. Right. So, or angels. Or angels. Yeah. So yeah, this whole like story just flies in the face of their version yeah. of Judaism. Um, it's starting to fall apart. Yeah. It, and I, they don't like that. Interesting, because this stuff never stops. Uh, there was, um, oh, I, I heard this story this week. There was a, a, a British scholar at Oxford. I forget his name. But he gave a presentation at Oxford on the resurrection of the dead, on the resurrection of Jesus. And he got up and he kind of defended the whole thing, the, the, the reliability of the accounts in the scriptures, all of the different arguments against it, uh, and all the, there's all the different schools of thought there in Oxford, sort of listening to what he had to say, at least the humanitarian. And so uh, they listened, and everybody afterwards came up and said, that was well done, very good job, that's just a fascinating thing. Uh, and there was one group uh, who, who did not like what he had to say, it was vehemently opposed to what he had to say. It was the religion department. <laughs> it was it was the Bible scholars, remember? Bible scholars. They all came to him and said, you're arguing nonsense. They're not talking about a physical resurrection. They're talking about a spiritual experience that they all had. 
uh, or something like this. Uh, 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 what was the phrase? Uh, oh, it was a, some sort of spiritual encounter that they had. The guy's response was, okay, well, so great, fine. What did they encounter? Yeah. Uh, but it strikes me that uh, this sort of thinking hasn't gone away. This denial of the resurrection and the supernatural. It's always around. Sadducees just now uh, work in religion departments at colleges and universities. <laughs> <laughs> Pharisees are pastors, so I what you do. Um, but, uh, but this is, um, it's just very interesting that the same issues that counter the resurrection of Christ here are the same ones we're facing now. And so you've got any number of theories trying to deny the resurrection of Christ. Any number of theories trying to deny the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and this one um, is so fascinating to me because Matthew puts it in his gospel. Says, well, someone's, the disciples stole the body. It's almost as if Matthew's saying, oh, really? Come and find it then. Show us where it is. I mean, Matthew's almost very brazen in putting this in his gospel, saying, look, we're so convinced that he's resurrected from the dead, we'll put the best argument up in the gospel against what we're saying. And the Jews are saying this everywhere, that we stole the body. Okay, right. where's the body? Show it. At least just go to the tomb. You can at least go and look in the tomb. And by the way, there is uh, ample evidence that the tomb was empty, that this is not a made-up story. This is not something you only find in the Gospels. Uh, but this is attested to outside of the Scriptures uh, as well. Uh, author named Josephus mentions uh, this, uh, this empty tomb. Um, and there's people who believe in the empty tomb. It, it, uh, there's a Roman historian who mentions this as well, who mentions the fact that uh, at one point in Jerusalem, this guy died on the cross, and his tomb was empty three days later, and it caused quite a stir among the people. You know, um, So this sort of stuff was not, as Paul says in the book of Acts, it didn't take place in a corner. People knew about this. It's everywhere. And, and there's uh, literature outside of the Gospels attesting to it. Not arguing that Jesus himself rose from the dead, but saying the tomb was empty. So where's the body? One of the arguments is the disciples stole it, but we've already sort of dismissed that one because why would the disciples steal it? And if they had stolen it, why did they die for the fact that they believed that he was risen from the dead? It doesn't make a lot of sense. So then perhaps the argument goes, maybe the Pharisees stole it. Maybe the Pharisees stole it so that no one could get it. But why would the Pharisees steal it? Or the Sadducees, the Jews? Why would the Jews steal the body? They want him dead. And if... Christianity starts catching fire like it did in the New Testament era. All the Jews had to do was say, to stop it, was say, let's go to the tomb, we'll show you the body. We'll show you the body of Jesus. If they stole it, all they had to do was say, here's the body. See, it's not, we have him, he's still dead. The Romans don't want him. Uh, someone said, suggested once that the Romans stole the body. But this doesn't even make sense. The Romans wanted, I mean, Pilate wanted to wash his hands of the thing. He wanted to be done with it as quickly as possible. Further, if the Romans uh, didn't kill someone on a cross, that would have made them look bad. And Romans, they don't like looking bad. <laughs> uh, so, all these arguments. Uh, some people argue the swoon theory that he didn't really die, uh, that he just passed out on the cross and they put him in the tomb and three days later he, he woke up, pushed the rock away. Um, very easy thing to do after the lashes and the bleeding and stabbing in the heart and all that, I'm sure. And no food in the way. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, I'm sure he's ready to go and roll stones away. Um, any number of arguments come up. Uh, the, my favorite one is the newer one uh, by this guy named John Dominic Cross, who is very influential. Uh, all of his books are at Barnes and Noble. So you know, he's a very scholarly. Uh, he's actually he is actually a pretty sharp guy, but he he's a, a history expert of this era. And he says people's bodies, they weren't put in tombs off the cross. Oh, they were just thrown to the dogs to be eaten. So Jesus was probably eaten by dogs. And with the disciples' experience, he goes back to the spiritual experience thing. They just have the spiritual experience, uh, collective spiritual experience. Jesus was probably eaten by dogs. That's why the tomb is empty. The, the problem Crossan has is he doesn't actually deal with the texts of Scripture, which attest, are, are attested to again and again as being historically reliable documents. He says they're not. They're just... I don't know, metaphors for overcoming your troubles by rising from the ashes. Give me a break. Go ahead. What does he, how does he explain Joseph of Arimathea? Uh, he probably says that didn't happen. It was a construct or something made up. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Anything you can't explain really didn't happen. But so even if you can't point. explain it, if it doesn't yeah. fit your worldview, like the Sadducees. I mean, think of this is, Crossan is a Sadducee. 
Because his world, he says, no resurrection, no angels. Therefore, it must be something. Now, I want to be a you know, cross and say, I want to be positive about this. I don't, I'm not a Sadducee. I'm not against Jesus. I just don't believe in a physical resurrection. So what I want to present is something that gives the human spirit hope, that lifts us up. What's really being talked about here is overcoming our spiritual anxieties, the things that kill us in this world, and uniting together and moving forward, just like the disciples did. They united together around this Jesus and carried on his teachings. Oh, the inspiration, the joy. He's going to puke in my <laughs> toilet. And it's just horrible stuff, you know? Because the message of Jesus was, I'm going to die and rise. Christianity is not an inspiring story. It's a true story about a man who died and rose again. And if he didn't die and rise again, you guys are wasting your time. At least you get free donuts this morning, right? Uh, that's the best thing we're doing here. But Jesus suffered and died on the cross for that often. Yeah, right, which like kicks you right in the guts. You're, and, and then we sit there and go, him too? Really? I, gotta, I don't know if you listened to this. I mentioned this a long time ago. There was a, a, a uh, oh, the thing by Rosenblatt that I wanted you guys to listen to in Bible study. Um, the gospel for Christians too. What is it called? Um, the gospel for those broken by the church. Yeah. And, if, <laughs> and that thing, one of my professors, he, he, if you get online and type in the gospel for those broken by the church, it's just this fantastic lecture. Um, it's pretty harsh, but it's it's worth a listen. Um, and in there he says, we're going to be amazed at who we see in heaven. And he says, there may even be Bible scholars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's really kind of interesting. It, it's um, on the website. For a church called Faith Lutheran, which must give you some Faith old. Capo, yeah, Faith yeah, Capistrano Faith Beach. Capistrano. Yeah. Your your friends, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there or you go to a website called New Reformation Press. Yeah. New Reformation Press, and there you find all kinds of goodies. Um, but that gospel for those broken by the church is just marvelous. Okay. So there's all these arguments against the resurrection. Look, and, and St. Paul will say this if Jesus is dead, you're dead. <laughs> there is no hope. Uh, and this is 1 Corinthians 15. This is the gospel that Jesus physically walked out of the grave. If he did not, you are dead in your sins and trespasses. There is no hope for us. It's up to the human spill and human spill. Human will and spirit. We'll call it the human spill. <laughs> yeah, it's up to the human spill to overcome all the problems in this world. Well, guess what? That hasn't worked out well at all. At all. And it eliminates Jesus. He, well, sure. he says, oh, I believe, you know, and I support Jesus and all that. But he doesn't have faith in it. No, no, of course not. No, it's and this is, everybody loves Jesus. No one's ever against Jesus. They just don't like what he has to say or do. You know what I mean? This is, this is sort of what it comes down to. Everybody is in favor of Jesus, over-likes Jesus. Um, that tells you something. Um, <laughs> it just so happens that the Jesus they like is of their own construct. In all honesty, if we really read Jesus seriously, there, we're going to find things we just don't like. We just don't want to hear. Um, and we're going to try and wiggle our way out of it and find our way around it. Um, we always will. Because Jesus is God and we're not. And that's not something we like to hear. So they've come up, all these people have come up with all these great philosophies and theories and uh, arguments to, to dismiss Jesus, to get him off the throne, to put him back in the tomb. Is it because of what came out of his mouth? Sure. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah, he said, "I was God. I'm God, right. and nobody wants a God right. other than themselves." Right. Um, he said, "I forgive you," which means there's something wrong with me, um, which no one wants to believe. Right. Um, he said, "I'm empowered. You're not. We don't like that." He said, "You're dead in your sins and trespasses." Well, Saint Paul said that, but Jesus essentially said that. Yeah. Um, he said all sorts of things that we just don't like. Right. And then said he was in charge, so we had to believe it. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, I, <laughs> so we have to die to ourselves so Christ can I live in us. I recently learned that, that when you tell somebody that you have God and Jesus Christ in your heart, and if they don't, they like disappear in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, no, that's okay, but when you put Jesus Christ in there, it freaks him out. Yeah, everyone likes God. Yeah. And if you think even like Jesus, he was a smart, nice guy. He told us to love people, so we should love people like Jesus said. He also said he was going to die and rise. Well, that just gets in the way. <laughs> it does. That's the, that's the beauty of it. It gets in the way of your little projects. Yeah, and people, when you say you have Christ, 
you put yourself on a very unlikable team. Really? It's like it's like being on the Yankees. <laughs> Nobody likes the Yankees, but they always win. Sorry, Twins. Well, the surf. Was um, really, uh, here's an how Yesterday, the surf was really big, and there's this one guy. He was like gold, fat goldfish in an aquarium tank, <laughs> just going around, you know. Swimming around, all the other fish eating everything up. It was so it was like it was good six to eight foot waves yesterday. Uh, uh. Lots of people crowding. This one guy, red and white surfboard, just he was like back and forth. He just couldn't be patient with the wave coming to him, you know, the law of spirit. You know. So I was watching him a couple times, you know. I, I was gonna go for a wave, and boom, he's like paddling. So so I let him go, you know. So finally. I see him, and he's trying to catch a wave, he's too deep, and the wave goes through him, and he like paddles, you know, he's paddling so hard, he comes in a little bit, and I catch the next wave behind him, he paddles all the way around, what we call back paddling, you know, surfers don't like that, he back paddles me to try to catch the wave, and I, I was like, hey, I'm holding my ground, you know, mm -hmm. and he came like right into me, and wiped out, you know, wiped us both out, I protected my board, I came up, and he's like all holler and mark. And I'm like, hey, you know, I'm sitting, I got a little irritable, I'm tired of, you know, you back paddle me, don't back paddle me, mm -hmm. right, you know? And I don't even think he knew what I was talking about. <laughs> but his mentality was like, well, hey, let's get in the parking lot, you know, we'll solve this, you know? And I'm like, hey, you already lost the fight, because I've got God on my side, you know? <laughs> like, well, go figure it out, what do you don't understand about back paddling, you know? And he's like, oh, come on, we'll, 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 we'll solve this out right now. And I go, you already lost the fight. I have Jesus Christ in my heart, buddy. Get out of here. <laughs> and that was it. I never saw him. Never saw him. <laughs> <laughs> he disappeared. It's, it's the name that drives off the demons. You see, that's a very nice thing. It's a good word. That's awesome. That's incredible. That's a good, well, that'll be in the sermon sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. But blatantly, blatantly back out. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My father-in-law has this great story that uh, uh, his dad, um, his, his, his dad had become friends with a guy who was trying to take advantage of him, trying to steal money from him. And it, this is my great, or my grandfather. And it, my grandfather-in-law is the sweetest guy in the whole world. He's such a nice guy. And he didn't want to be mean to this guy. This guy was trying to rip money off from him. The guy kept calling him and kept calling him. Uh, and uh, it was really beginning to bother him. So my father-in-law answered the phone one day. And the guy called and he said, I want to talk to, to, to Dick. And, and uh, my father-in-law said, in the name of Jesus, you stop calling her. And the guy said, what did you say to me? <laughs> he goes, in the name of Jesus, you stop calling her. And the guy's like, in the name of Jesus. He goes, in the name of Jesus. And he said, I just kept saying it to him. And the guy's like, I need to talk to Dick now. And started to get like really angry. Uh -huh. So he thought he was going to make a bu bunch of money off of him. And Steve said, no, you don't call her anymore. In the name of Jesus. And uh, the guy hung up the phone. 45 minutes later, calls right back. And Steve answered the phone and said, I thought I told you to not call her. And the guy's like, oh, and he hung up the phone again. <laughs> um, but the guy doesn't, hasn't called since. You know, there's just something about that. All right. Um, the answer for telemarketers. <laughs> hey, hey, there's something to that. When we think of anything more evil than a telemarketer. Okay. Uh, well, on that note then, uh, Jesus is really alive, and that's really quite something. Uh, and next week, you know what? Let's take the week off next week, so no class. Uh, as if we've ever had that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, then next week we'll do, we'll close out with the Great Commission, which we could spend a, easily a whole class on. Uh, and then we'll figure out something for our next class. All right. Great. Thanks, you guys. For more information on Faith Lutheran Church of Moore Park, California, and for more podcast episodes like this one, visit us on the web at www.faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.